So thank you so much. Uh, I'm really glad to be glad to join this webinar organized by the International Carnivorous Plant Society, Plant, Plant Society. I will talk about pre-capture mechanisms in carnivorous plants, primarily based on our own research, our own research. So just, just a few slides on like, on my background. I am basically working in a, in a research institute in south of India. Our institute is Jawaharlal Nehru Tropical Botanic Garden and Research Institute. It's a conservatory botanic garden of tropical plant resources. We conserve plant species here, primarily from the Indian uh, plant species we conserve. We also have research programs on like, for example, biotechnology, plant chemistry, microbiology, et cetera. We are located here at the south of India, which is very close to Sri Lanka. And this is a map of our institute. It's 121 hectares. It's at the foothills of the Western Ghats. Western Ghats is a hill ranges extending from south of India till say, I'll say Bombay, till Bombay. So our primary focus is on plant species in the, in the Western Ghats region in India and other parts of India. And even we have plant species from outside India here conserved in our botanic garden. Just, just to give a list of it, we have ferns, gymnosperms, arboretum, fruit plants, several plant species we can save here. 2,842 species in, in another bunch, we have 2,300 species conserved here. In a total of, our institute has about 5,000 different species conserved in, in, in our institute botanic uh, conservatories. We also have discovered several new species from this botanical, this, this geographical region, flowering plants, fungi, mushrooms, etc. That's about the institute. That's about the institute. It's the south of India again. So if anyone is visiting the institute, if you are interested in seeing some plant species here, you can come to us. So I will come to carnivory in, uh, in plants. Plant carnivory is the ability of plants to attract, okay, to attract, catch, kill, and digest insects to obtain nutrients. Nutrients. And then, Just a second. Okay. Charles Darwin recognized that carnivorous plants thrive in nutrient point poor soil by capturing insects and other small animals, other small animals. And he published the book Insectivorous Plants in 1875. And these are the pictures from his book Insectivorous Plants, published in 1875. He noted that. He noted that Drosera retentifolia is capturing insects, and these are the drawings from that book. I'm sure we are all familiar with this. I'll show you some pictures, and then I will get into my research. This is Drosera on the left side, Venus flytrap, then Nepenthes picture. Very good pictures, actually, Cephalotus. And then this is Uticularia, and this is Nepenthes attenborough which is a IUCN threatened species, basically from the Philippines, named after David Attenborough. And it is endemic to the Palawan Island in Philippines, in the Philippines. This is the majestic Nepenthes Raja, the largest Nepenthes species, now largest picture in the Nepenthes genus. And this is a mutualism. We are all familiar with this, I am sure about it. And this is Venus flytrap. And this is again Tosera. These are all wonderful pictures. And all we are talking about, we are talking about, based on this article in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA in 2015, about 650 to 700 species. And then main ones are Dynia, Tosera, Nepenthes, Cephalotus, Darlingtonia, Saracenia, Pingicula, and Uticularia. This is the list published in 2015 in PNAS. It's about 700 species, very special plants around the globe, around, around, around 
various parts in the on the surface of earth now in this article in nature plants in 2017 it says like the phenomenon of insectivory or in a broader sense carnivory in plants is a striking example of evolution and the adaptability of organisms to cope with challenging environmental conditions such as nutrient shortage although the concept of botanical carnivory has been known for over 150 years this is an important point actually its molecular mechanisms and evolutionary origins have not been well understood until recently the studies are like there are more more studies coming on this particular area in the last two or three decades and we are understanding more about plant carnivory in recent times this is a picture a line drawing of the trap of nepenthes cassiana there is only one nepenthes species native to india which is nepenthes ghasiana it is basically from the khasi hills in meghalaya in northeast india so we have the species in our conservatory which is at the south of india for about the last 3 4 decades and our most of our studies are based on this particular indian pitcher plant which is nepenthes ghasiana so this is a line drawing where it is showing a leaf and then extension which is a tendril and then we have the tray trap the top portion is the lid and then we have the peristome the most important portion is the peristome then the slippery zone and then we have the bottom digestive zone surprisingly i am basically a chemist who is interested in studying the chemical molecules in plants and surprisingly we started looking at this particular pitcher plant about 15 years back in our institute and we brought this traps pitch, pictures into our lab for a chemical study and rather accidentally we put one of the pictures into an instrumental uv uv display uv scanner which was set at ultraviolet 366 nanometer and suddenly we to our surprise we noticed a blue blue ring on the top this was our first observation of the blue ring on the top in an ultraviolet uh machine in our in our lab and then we looked at like several other pictures of cassiana and in our conservatory we have about 14 species of nepenthes we checked in all of them like looking for this blue light whether it's universal or not we found that it is really universal in every every nepenthes that we tested we found a blue ring on the top and it's only on the top from outside just the lid is like there is a faint blue but otherwise the intense intense blue is on the important portion of the peristome so this was a striking observation for us we published this observation in uh, in plant biology in 2013 2013 and then we we checked in several other species it's a different in the species that we tested at that point of time in ultraviolet and when it is an ultraviolet there is a blue emission like this which is significant striking blue emission from the top of the uh, pitcher trap and it's it's pitcher fluid if you take it into a small vial it is also blue fluorescent and we these are various pictures that we have taken in our equipment in our instrument it's all blue and after that after our publication we have seen that and i have taken these pictures from the web there are several uh, you know hybrids and nepenthes species across the globe like picture pictures on the web they are all strikingly blue in ultraviolet these are all pictures i have taken from the web this is this is another one this is another one this is the normal picture on the left side and the blue fluorescence on the right side in ultraviolet several of them the young traps the intensity of the blue is low and when it is fully open and the pre capture is in full intensity uh, the blue in so full pre capture is in full the blue intensity is really high so it's some way correlated to the pre capture in 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 the pendulous traps this is the picture in our publication 2013 if you look at the lower panel the young ones young ones 
the blue light is very mild and when it is ready when it is fully grown up picture and it is capturing the blue intensity is very high and on the right panel for example the panel g it's a dead picture near dead picture the blue intensity is really very low and this is another one i have taken from the uh, internet it's also showing that the normal one below and the top one is blue on top and this is a cross sectional view of the peristome in confocal microscopy that we have taken here and it's uh, two different views a lateral view and a cross sectional view we can see the micro structures at the peristome but it's all in the cross sectional view also it is really blue the peristome portion is really blue this is saracenia from our conservatory which is also emitting some blue in ultraviolet this is cephalotus it's also showing the blue at the top portion this is a recent uh, report uh, on carnivorous published in carnivorous plant newsletter on helium fora which is basically south american and it is also showing the blue light on top several helium fora species like three four helium fora species they are all blue on the top and our public our uh, finding in 2013 we published and i said we published in plant biology after that it has covered it was covered by various media across the globe for example bbc national geographic smithsonian magazine and dust vehicle and it's across the globe it has gone everywhere i'll show you some of the coverings this is in bbc on this finding our finding national geographic and uh, smithsonian and this is french magazine bbc focus magazine this is again smithsonian this is dust vehicle on the left and this is i, I send our findings to david attenborough for publications david attenborough he has written in his own handwriting saying that when i'm doing my next docu doc documentary i will probably cover your very interesting finding and this has appeared in very several books this is a books uh, this is a book for the cover page of the book for kids here and in several uh, review books books and reviews these are scientific reviews where uh, this finding has appeared and also it's a it's a scientific film uh, which is night on earth it's available in night on earth actually it's a netflix science film night on earth and episode 3 is jungle nights this is actually coming in there uh, there also like this this particular discovery they are covering this there also i also received like throughout this year several questions about this for example this is a journalist working on a documentary about the moon on earth he asked me a question like are you studying this phenomenon still studying this phenomenon can you explain to me like how plant uses moon to see the questions about like how intense is the light the ultraviolet in the night times questions similar questions like several other questions related to this uh, i received several questions over the years on this in the field we are still studying this we are still very active in this particular uh, carnivorous plant research so we are still answering some of the questions but this is definitely true the blue emission is definitely true and there are other questions coming from and this is another one from the guinness world records he says like we are doing a feature in our 2023 book about bioluminescence and biofluorescence and are you able to share your picture i shared this picture to the guinness book of world records and then another observation is what about like other life forms on the surface of earth and do they have this kind of signaling of blue fluorescence in 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 their systems for example this is another study appeared in 2017 in proceedings of the national academy of sciences this is on frogs this is on frogs they are really blue emitting in in ultraviolet this is because and and they also showed that this is molecular these are the molecules emitting the blue fluorescence in the ultraviolet this is another study in scientific reports which is a nature group journal and and it is on again on kind of frogs from south southeastern brazil uh they have bony plates at their uh, top and it's also blue emitting blue fluorescent there's a more pictures on that this is a journal article on that the same study this is on chameleons again in scientific reports in 2018 they are also emitting some blue light blue blue uh 
emission fluorescence uh, from their frontal portions. And this is in shark, this is in parrot. So this fluorescence emission as a signal in on the surface of Earth in various life forms is rather common. And it's kind of a signaling like on when various aspects, for example, finding their uh, food or finding uh, it's a sexual signaling, all these things, fluorescence is an important signal. And another, another report, which is which appeared in Plant Biotechnology Journal in 2022, it's like they introduced the, the, the fluorescent genes into this plant, coffee plant, and it is emitting blue fluorescence. And they, in fact, they are using this plant, these modified plants to trap insect pests. This is the first part of our study, which quite we, we really accidentally found the blue fluorescence emission from the peristomes of Nepenthes traps, Nepenthes traps. And the second portion of our study, I'll explain now, this another another component of a study. This is Nepenthes traps. I'll just give a dimension. Like for example, the picture length is picture length is 30 centimeter, and fluid is it can hold up to it is holding up to three liters of the pitcher fluid at the bottom. This is David Attenborough, uh, sorry, Nepenthe Attenborough. It's again 30 centimeter long, a pitcher fluid it's holding up to two liters. This is Palavanensis, the three largest uh, Nepenthe straps actually. This is third one, it's holding up to two liters. Compared to these three, for example, Raja, and then Attenborough, and then Palavanensis, this is very small. The Indian uh, pitcher plant, its spray trap, the pitcher is very small. It's only 15 centimeter long and it, it holds up to 3.25 ml. It's a very small trap. But in our field studies, when we went, we, we regularly go to the field and uh, you know do some experiments on these particular plants. And when we apply some pressure on the unopened picture before opening, if you apply some pressure with your fingers onto this trap, unopened ones, we feel a slight pressure back on our fingers, back on our fingers. We thought like this is not really not empty. The trap is not empty. There's something in, inside that, which could possibly be a gaseous, it's a, it's a gaseous medium inside within that. We assumed that. And then we started working on this to find the gas medium, the, to analyze the gas medium within the trap. We have taken these traps into our National Center for Earth Sciences here, where they have uh, they have an atmospheric sciences lab. We started testing this on gas chromatography on a regular basis for a long time on several pictures. We found that there's a high concentration of carbon dioxide within these traps before it's opening, before opened. So there's about 4,000 ppm of carbon dioxide gas within these traps. The normal atmospheric carbon dioxide level is about 420. So there's the carbon dioxide level within the traps before opening is very high, very high. We found that we, we checked it in several of them, different species and different hybrids. This is a rather consistent observation. It's about 3000 to 4,500 ppm of carbon dioxide within the trap on we found that and we published this finding in scientific reports in 2017. And when it is open, when the trap is open, still it is emitting the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere on, on, on a regular basis. And the, and, the, and the emission coming out of the open trap is something like around 450 ppm, just above the atmospheric, atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide level. But there is a gradient. There is a gradient of carbon dioxide. Uh, coming out of the open trap, which is which is an attractant, which is an attractant. And secondly, secondly, a carbon dioxide dissolved the pitcher fluid dissolves into the pitcher fluid, which is a watery medium, and it is one of the factors making it making it acidic. The pitcher fluid acidic. The enzymes in the pitcher fluid they work in acidic medium. And this is one factor which is making the pitcher fluid acidic. And this is, it, it works as a preservative, also as a preservative of the pitcher fluid. Uh, this was published in 2017. 
we also believe that we also like we also found these naphthoquinones like for example drosterone and 5 methyl drosterone in our chemical analysis in the pitch fluid in the pitch fluid they are known antifungal molecules they are known antifungal molecules other studies also observed the presence of these naphthoquinones in the pitch fluid for example from max planck and other 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 research has also found the presence of these naphthoquinones in the pitch fluid so they have some kind of intelligence like they understand like sequence levels of lid opening carbon dioxide release and precapture is sensed by these plants and these are the molecules we identified these molecules in the pitch fluid by direct real time mass spectrometry which was published in journal of experimental botany in 2011 so they release these naphthoquinones into the pitch fluid preventing the infections from incoming prey i we believe that it's preventing the infections from uh, insects coming into the system from outside and there is a recent study from this is from max planck institute and in plus 1 in 2021 they say that naphthoquinones are acting as phyto antisepins they are protecting the plants by from insect herbivory this naphthoquinones this is another recent study and another important point is these these pictures are uh, scanning electron microscopes of the inner side of the trap inner side of the pitcher trap of nepenthes cassiana and these are the sorry these are the, just a, just a second these are the stomata usually we see two guard cells for stomata but within the pitcher within the pitcher in the in these uh, pictures these pictures there the, the 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 stomata is really modified there is only one guard cell really modified and there is only only one guard cell and this is because this is because we hypothesize that this is because this is in high carbon dioxide medium carbon dioxide has a real good influence on the stomatal uh, uh, shape and its its growth so it's modifying the stomata into a single guard cell this is highly modified stomata within the uh, pitcher trap of nepenthes cassiana this is we believe that's a significant effect of the carbon dioxide within the trap the single guard cell with a single guard cell we see only a single guard cell within this so it's actually the carbon dioxide is having several effects on this first of all it's it's gradually being emitted when it's open secondly it has a significant effect on the pitch fluid making it acidic and it's preserving the pitch fluid and it's also modifying also modifying the stomata within the trap and if we take a sem of the outside portion of the trap the uh, nepenthes trap there the stomata is normal with two guard cells so only the inside portion we have the stomata is really modified because of the carbon dioxide enriched atmosphere so we also like analyzed what is the source of carbon dioxide within the trap it's because it's more of a respiratory uh, machinery the trap compared to the leaf so respiration is a source of the carbon dioxide within the closed cavities of nepenthes species so it has a significant effect carbon dioxide has significant effect on the on the spray trap so we we showed that we proved that nepenthes pitchers are carbon dioxide enriched cavities carbon dioxide emission from open pitchers acts as a sensory cue attracting insects towards the trap they also like tax as natural model systems mimicking an anticipated elevated carbon dioxide scenario on earth in the future it's a model system where there is when we have high carbon dioxide its behavior is like when we have high carbon dioxide it's acting like a model system but so these are some pictures i'm showing this is the lid some scanning electron microscope of the 
lid portion in lid of the lid of Nepenthes cassiana picture. These are the nectaries. We can also see the stomata on the left side lower panel. And these are the glands in the liquid zone, in the liquid zone of Nepenthes cassiana. Once again, these are the Nepenthes raja, Nepenthes attenboroi, and Nepenthes palavanensis, the largest Nepenthes traps. And these are the various, sorry, these are the various influences on top of the, of the peristome. For example, there is blue fluorescence signaling, there's carbon dioxide emission, there's olfactory cues, the surface is wettable, and there is nectar. All these factors are playing together towards this evolutionary adaptation of trapping an insect or other arthropod into this, into this system. And then it slips down and then they are digested by the digestive enzymes and the nutrients are taken into the, into the system. And like we, we demonstrated that there is carbon dioxide within in the traps, Nepenthes traps. And then there is a recent paper in Anne's Botany saying that there is an enzyme, they, they discovered an enzyme which is really linked to the formation of carbon dioxide within these traps. This is just like some news reports I'm showing. This is from BBC Natural History Unit. I received this. They are going to picture this, the carbon dioxide emission and also the blue fluorescence for their documentaries. This is in Asia Times, which appeared in 2017 on this carbon dioxide discovery. This is an Indian national newspaper, which is where it, the carbon dioxide discovery has been covered. This is another one in Indian newspaper. We are still on this, on the chemistry and pre-capture mechanisms on carnivorous plants. We are running a program, a research program from the government of India, Department of Science and Technology, on finding the chemical molecules in Nepenthes cassiana in the Indian pitcher plant. And we discovered several molecules, small secondary metabolites, small molecules, so plumbagen, lupinone, lupule, etc. in this. It's still going on. We found, we so far discovered about 40 molecules from Nepenthes cassiana, and some are really linked to pre capture. We really have, in all this chemical study, we really have surprising findings now. We are trying to write it, to, to publish these findings, and will come very soon. And chemistry is also revealing like more, more really interesting facts on this particular uh, systems and linked to their pre capture. This is another one. This is actually, uh, we, we pictured the Cassiana traps in the field for about 48 hours, day and night. This is an infra infrared thermography uh, pictures of Nepenthes Cassiana traps opening. For example, the first panel on the left side, upper left side, is night 12.30 a.m. It's before opening. It's before opening, unopened trap. And this next one is 4.30 a.m. It's slightly opening. The lid is opening. 5.30, 6.30, 7.30. By 8.30, the lid is open. And 9.30, it's still open. By 10.30, it's, it's really good. It's open. And then the rest of the time, it's in daytime. If you look at it, the blue in this indicates like it has the lowest temperature in the system. It's the lowest temperature in the system. For example, if you look at the, the panel on the right in the second row, second row, even after opening, the peristome portion is showing the blue. Still, it is blue. So it, is, it still has the moisture. The picture has in the night times, a lot of moisture and, and the high humid scenarios, a lot of moisture coming into it. And it is holding the moisture and the peristome portion is holding the moisture or the lowest, it has the lowest temperature even till the daytime, say till 9.30 or even up to, till up to 9.30, it's still blue. So this is still in, in publication and we are trying to send it to plant biology again. So we have more data coming on this. Now into some interesting observations. This is Nepenthes Raja, uh, a mutualism and observed in Borneo. Uh, I'm sure we are all familiar with this here. This is Raja and this is a tree shoe coming in. It's taking the nectar and it's dropping as go, are going down in the pitcher fluid. This is another one. This is, I'm just showing you some uh, previous scientific studies on this particular area. 
This is another one. This is a woolly bat living on the Nepenthes hemsleyana trap. And it's also a mutualism. It's kind of an exchange between these two organisms. And this is these are drawings on new phytologists in 2018 on Nepenthes raja, Nepenthes macrophylla, and Nepenthes loi. They are all involved in mutualistic interactions in Bonian studies. This is another important paper which appeared in 2005 in Nature. They actually, this is from, uh, if I remember correctly, it's from MIT. They say like the flight trap closing time is 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. Same time, in uticularia, it's much faster. The suction of the pump, of the, of the trap is less than a millisecond. It's actually surprising. This is 100 milliseconds. This is less than a millisecond. The study appeared in 2011 in Proceedings of the Royal Society. Um, it's much faster movement. And another one in current biology in 2016, the flight trap can count, like it can count one, two, three. Yeah, just a, just a, uh, you know, hit is not going to close the trap. If you have consistent hits like one, two, three, it's going to close. So they can count up to say one, two, three. Three very good observations, like the flight trap is closing in 100 milliseconds. Whereas the utricular area section is less than a millisecond and the flight trap can count pressed steps to dissolve them alive that they can count like one, two, three up to very small numbers. Very good findings recently. There are a lot of papers coming in this particular research area of plant carnivory. This is another one, slip technology by you know taking inspiration from the Nepenthes inner slippery membrane, they have developed medical devices and even engineering devices. This is another one, a nature paper. This is another one. This is the, uh, from the SLIPS lab. Uh, sorry, from the Risen Institute in Harvard University. This is calcium signaling, signaling in, in the Venus flight trap. So this, this is like our studies are on the, we discovered the blue fluorescence. And secondly, we found that there is carbon dioxide within the traps. And we have a lot more results now, which we are trying to publish. We usually, we, I said like we, I have a chemistry background. So we publish our research in uh, journals like this, uh, Industry Crops and Products, Journal of Ethnopharmacology, Criminal Botany, just like this pub we publish. And this is all our contribution from our uh, PhD scholars and project fellows in, in our lab. So once again, I am from, uh, basically our institute is in South India. If anyone from the group is coming to India, if you are interested in seeing some plants, please come to, it's near Trivandrum in uh, Southern India. Please come to our institute. So these are our, some of our stories on our research on uh, plant carnivory. Uh, I hope it was interesting to the group attending. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was fantastic. And I would love to visit India and you one day soon. Yeah, 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 sure, please come. All right, so thank you for everyone who's attending live. If you have questions, please put them in the chat below. But first, I just wanna tell everyone about the International Carnivorous Plant Society just for about two minutes, and then I'm going to direct all the best questions. All right, so this May, we will be hosting the 13th International Carnivorous Plant Society's International Conference in Japan. It is being sponsored by multiple societies that are inside Japan. And you can learn more about the conference by going to our website, carnivorousplants.org slash about slash conferences, or you can go directly to the Japanese link which I will have in the description below. We are going to be near Himeji Castle. It's a couple hours south of uh, southwest of Tokyo by bullet train. The conference is May 26th through May 31st. And uh, we have a couple of days of presentations and then we have a couple of days of field trips. Here is the banquet hall and the presentation hall. We're going to be going to um, 
botanical gardens, like I mentioned, one of them just received last year a Guinness World Record for the longest uh, pitcher. We're also going to be seeing some rare Nepenthes like uh, Clipiata, and we're also going to be seeing carnivorous plants from all over the world that they grow there. So I'm excited for that. The last day, we're going on a little uh, field trip to see some wild pinguicula, and hopefully they will be blooming. The most important thing to remember is that March 31st is the deadline. March 31st is the deadline to register for the conference, to say that you want to present at the conference, to book the banquet and the field trips. March 31st. It's coming up soon. All right. So the International Carnivorous Plant Society has a lot of different uh, education and uh, educational resources for students, adults, everyone. Last year, we made five animated videos about how to grow carnivorous plants and a little bit about um, carnivorous plant evolution. And our really big education component every year is World Carnivorous Plant Day. It is always the first Wednesday of May because we needed to avoid the first Saturday in May, which of course is World Naked Gardening Day. And we do not want to combine those two things. I am wearing the original t-shirt for World Carnivorous Plant Day, which was three years ago. And uh, this year it is going to be on May 3rd, 2023. But if you wanted to check out last year's World Carnivorous Plant Day, you can go to the International Carnivorous Plant Society's YouTube or Facebook page, and you can see the over 24 videos that we posted about cultivation, conservation, lots of things. If you want to be more involved with the ICPS, you can become a member. And when you become a member, you receive four newsletters a year, full color. They talk about uh, new discoveries and they also give you some growing tips. A benefit of being a ICPS member is that you can order seeds very cheaply from our seed bank. And if you want to support our educational programs, like the webinars, like the roundtables, like our uh, Carnivores in the Classroom grant, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, you can buy the t-shirt that I'm wearing, or you could buy a tote bag, mugs, notebooks. So every year for the past two years, we have hosted Carnivores in the Classroom, which allows teachers in K through 12 classrooms in public and private schools to get funds to add carnivorous plants to their room. And we want this to be global. The first year, we had several countries. Last year, we basically just had North America. So we want to find classrooms all over the world. The grant application is always open August 1st through August 31st. So it's a little bit of ways off, but if you know a teacher, tell them about this grant opportunity. And if you want to fund even more classrooms, you can go to carnivorousplants.org slash donate. All right. And like I mentioned, World Carnivorous Plant Day is May 3rd, 2023 this year. You can learn more about it by going to our website about and then World Carnivorous Plant Day. Another exciting part about that is every year we have a photo contest. You do not need to be a member of ICPS to enter. Everyone is encouraged to submit five photos. The deadline is April 14th. And um, if you are one of the winners, you get a one-year membership to the ICPS. And what I really like is that the judges for this year are the winners from last year. All right, so with that, we have a couple of questions. And all right, we're going to get started. A little known fact is that David Attenborough and I have the same birthday. We're just 61 years apart. All right, so the first question is. Well, the first comment is from Jane. She said, some of the coolest discoveries have happened by accident. And that was when you were talking about your, you kind of accidentally put the pictures near UV light and noticed it. Clarify why insects are attracted to CO2. 
Ah, CO2 is an insect, known insect attractant. It's it's CO2 traps are used to trap insects, mosquitoes, etc. So it's a known insect attractant. So the the discovery was like it's first time we found that there is carbon dioxide within this nap and the straps. It's slowly coming outside, like slowly emitting the carbon dioxide. So it's it's attracting. We have done some field trials with like carbon dioxide injecting through the traps at various levels. When you have carbon dioxide and when you don't have carbon dioxide within that, the carbon dioxide emitting traps are uh, traps are actually capturing more of the insects. So field trials are also proving that. So carbon dioxide is a non-insect attractant. All right, very good. So John wants to know, how can we help the carbon dioxide production inside the pitcher plants in cultivation? Is that a is that possible to allow to cause them to produce more CO2? Carbon dioxide is coming as a you know outcome of the respiratory process within the trap, within the trap. So how do we enhance the production of carbon dioxide in cultivation is to be is to be looked into, is to be looked into. I don't have a right away answer to that, but I will, I will look into it. Have you noticed factors that influence the concentrations of CO2? We are still into this. We are still working on it. We will have more answers in the coming years on this, but definitely they are emitting carbon dioxide. Do you know if other pitcher plants like Darlingtonia, Saracenia, Cephalotus, do you know if they also produce CO2 when growing their pitchers? So far, our studies on carbon dioxide emission are based on Nepenthes and its hybrids. They're all consistent. We have not, so far, we have not tested on Saracenia or on Darlingtonia. So I don't have that data, but I, it's, it will be very, really interesting to test that, test that, whether they are emitting it or not. All right, very good. That question was from J-Dub. And now we have a question from Greg. Do you know how many Nepenthes species have anesthesia in their nectar? What is in that nectar? Uh, anesthe like uh, anesthesia makes them sleepy. Uh, anesthetic molecules, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, we actually, we are now, as I said, we are working on Cassiana, the chemistry of the nectar of Nepenthes Cassiana. We have real interesting finding that there are some molecules which are really hallucinating the coming insect. Mm -hmm. Anesthetic molecules in the insect. We have the data. We are right now, we are trying to publish it. So next time, by next year, I will come <laughs> back to you with that data published. Perfect. I know oh. that probably seven years ago, they said that Saracenia, mm -hmm. one species of Saracenia had a chemical called conine in it that made, that made the yes. bugs drunk. But then yeah. um, it turned out that all Saracenia species have a little bit of that chemical. That's true. I'm, I am aware of that. It's an alkaloid. Saracenia has that. There are previous reports on Saracenia having conine in that, in the traps. So Nepenthes has a different molecule. I assure you that I am sure that it's a different molecule in Nepenthes nectar, which is really like toxic to the insects. All right, J-Dub says, how does carbon dioxide production affect the metabolism of Highland Nepenthes? Does it allow them to digest their insects? Carbon dioxide, just like in soda water, it dissolves into the water medium of the pitcher fluid, right? It dissolves into that. It makes it acidic. Most of the enzymes working, the, doing the digestion in the trap, they work in acidic medium. So this is in fact, carbon dioxide is in, in fact helping the pitcher fluid to remain acidic. That's that's the way, that is, that is, that's, that's why it's helping the digestion process. All right, very good. And the last question I think for today is from William. Do you know if the blue fluorescence in the peristome of Nepenthes attracts specific insects? So far in our, uh, you know, search, Nepenthes is not very specific on its, on, on its, uh, you know, praise coming into it. So there is nothing specific on it small insects and other arthropods are coming into it. There is nothing specific to particular 
uh, kind of insects. There's nothing so far in our knowledge. And then William added, do you think the CO2 and the blue fluorescents are attracting different insects or are the, those two uh, adaptations working together to attract? Good question. I do not have the data on that right now. I do not have the data. It's a very good question. Whether they are attracting different kinds of insects, we will, we will look into that. It's a very good question. All right. Very good. So I heard you promise me you'll come back in a year. <laughs> come back and I'll come back next year with more interesting data results. Sure. Yeah. Perfect. So thank you everyone for attending live. And uh, we have a couple of comments that say thank you so much. Have a great day. And uh, a lot of people are saying awesome. They can't wait for you to return. And I agree with them. Thank you so much. I'll come next year. It's not a surprise that gardeners, educators, and scientists are fascinated by these unique plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society, or ICPS, not only love these plants, but welcomes growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. The ICPS even started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate them. The free online event is held the first Wednesday of May. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.